have at the table Pam Arciro, a puppeteer. Yes, ma'am. Who has played the role of Grangina. Grangetta. Grangetta, that is. <laughs> I made her a different Italian name for 31 years. And real quickly, we have a picture of you with Grangetta oh, great. Um, on Sesame Street. When you first got the role, how many years did it take to get this? Well, um, my audition was very interesting. It was once a month, once a week for four months. Four months? Yeah, um, because they had to make sure that you ha puppetry is not something everybody knows. And I was, I got my degree in puppetry from UConn and I went and there was an audition for Sesame Street. And um, so, but they wanted to workshop you in. So you had to go once a week to this workshop and they started with 300 people and they ended up with two of us after four months. Every week, every, at the, after the workshop, they say, you come back next week. You come back next week for four months. And you're, you're doing a lot of hand wringing thinking, yes. am I going to get this I'm role? not going to be called this time. Oh, no, this is it. So before we get to how this all rolls out, puppetry at UConn, a big deal. Huge deal. One of, one of the few countries in the, in the, one of the school, few schools in the country to offer this? Correct. And they offer three degrees, maybe four now, I'm not sure, but they do offer a BFA, an MA, and an MFA. And it's very few schools offer three degrees in puppetry. And you have how many degrees in puppetry? Who, me personally? Yes. I, I have an undergraduate in dance and a graduate in puppetry, so I have just one. But. How does one go into puppetry? You kind of, everybody Little comes, kid, you've no, got some, puppets some around people, the house? Some people go in from the time they're eight years old, this is what they wanted to be. And some are like me, where um, there was a man named Kermit Love who came from New York, and he was the original builder of Big Bird. And he came to teach at the University of Hawaii. And I took the class and went, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a puppeteer. It makes so much sense. I sing, I dance, I act, and I like to make stuff. This is puppetry. But you never wanted to be on the stage. You wanted to. Oh no, I was. I was on the stage. You were on too. the stage, but yeah. then you. But then you went into the puppetry. Once I went into puppetry, it didn't matter so much because the character is the important part, not you. How do you become as one with a puppet in a role? It's almost like channeling. You find the character inside of you that connects, and then you learn who that character is on top of that. You know, if you're playing, Grangetta is very grouchy. Um, she is always crampy, but she has a heart of gold, which is my connection to her, is that really this grouchy exterior is protecting this very loving person underneath who's scared to let it out. You've played that role for how many years? You've been on 30. Sesame Street, 31 years. 31 years, she evolved right. at, at some point. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did she evolve, and did you have any say in that? Well, the writers give you what you need to do, but as you do more things that, that the writers like, you'll get more interesting roles coming in. Um, and, and Sesame is going through kind of a change right now. They're, they're narrowing it down to fewer characters. So I'm a, I'm a secondary character as far as Grangetta goes. But she has, she's changed over the years. I mean, she and Oscar have a very special relationship, and they always have and they like to make each other unhappy. In fact, they were gonna get married for a while and they figured it might make them happy, so they didn't. But little did I know, I should have married him because most marriages are not so happy, right? Did you come up with that voice or did they help you with that? Um, that voice was actually established by a guy who did her for one year and then they said, we want this voice and I came in and, and I voice matched him and then that's also how she evolved. She became more my voice than his voice as it went on. Brian Meal was the gentleman's name who did her first. For working, one season. Working with the brilliant Jim Henson, what was that like? Um, it's interesting to work with someone who's truly a genius in, in so many ways. Because re everything we did had a certain ring to it. And he even in breaks, right, you're sitting waiting to go on, and he'd be doing things like, see, put your hands like this. Let's see how this looks. Oh, great. Let's see if we can do this. I have this idea of making a puppet of just this. And you go, Okay, and everybody would jump in and do it. His mind was always, 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 always clicking with ideas about puppetry and ideas about theater and ideas about television. Jim's love really was television initially. That's what attracted him to doing puppets because he could do puppets on television. What are we missing by not having him around? Because his son has stepped in. Right, um, and he's a different person. I mean, Jim... Sure. His son is a lovely, lovely guy, but he has kind of a different view of the world. Jim's view of the world was very positive and very much that we're here to make the world a much, much better place. That's our job and that we should be nice to each other. That was Jim's goal always. He, you know, he said that so many times, just 
have a good time and be nice to each other. And um, what's missing for me is I think Jim also loved innovation and he would have had so much fun with all the things we have now with the cell phones and cameras and everybody has, you know, we all make movies on our phone now. And he would have had a ball with that, creating tons and tons of stuff. And it's just, he was that creative mind that would have taken some of the things we have so much further, so much quicker, and in terms of puppets. You fun. mentioned you had a baby shower on the set. Yeah, Tell I me did. about that. Um, I, did the characters show up? Well, or? they're there in the boxes. They live on the <laughs> set. The humans are there. Yeah, the, the humans are there. there. And, um, you know, on a set, the crew and the cast become your family. So they I had this big shower, they surprise shower for my first son. Um, they called me and said, do you have to come in and do this voiceover? And I went, oh, God, I got to go all the way in the city. And I was about nine months pregnant. I'm just going, oh, I don't want to do this. All right, I show up and it's huge shower everywhere and everyone laughing and puppets greeting you and talking to your belly. <laughs> because for decades, you've been commuting from Connecticut yes. to the city. Yes, absolutely. A grind some days, I, I would assume. Yeah, yeah, some days. But we don't work a lot, remember. Um, in the old days, we did work four or five months a year. We'd do about 100 shows a year. So we'd be four or five months in and out of the city. Um, now we only do about 24. So it's about six or eight weeks. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much of a grind. It's not a grind because I love what I do. I love going in. I lo you do this too. You love your work. You love showing up in the morning. Love thinking, what's the next part of the script that we're going to do? Or how is this going to be different? And um, You not only do characters, mm -hmm. but you also are a part of a puppetry conference. Correct which happens to be going on right now. Right. Tell me where it is and tell me what you do there. I am the artistic director of the National Puppetry Conference at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center in Waterford. And um, my job is to, I run the circus. <laughs> I love I, that. <laughs> I, uh, you Acrobats, know, right, everything, going on everyone, at the everything that's going on. I, I select who comes in to teach, um, what the coursework will be, what, how many, people come in. I also select all the candidates that come in to the program. Um, we have about 65 participants. We turn away another hundred or so. Um, so it is a selective process. People apply. From across the country. From across the world. Across right now we world. have um, a participant from India and a participant from Zimbabwe and our guest artists and teachers, one from Germany, two from Peru. So we have a broad, and everywhere in the United States people come from, oh, one from China as well. So it's an internationally known program, um, very well respected. And this is our 25th year. It's our 25th anniversary of running the show. I started that as um, a guest artist, not as a, not as a director, and became the director about 13 years ago of the program. What kind of stars have you put out out of this conference? What's well, happened over those 25 uh, years? Oh, let's see. Um, many of those people have gone on to go to the Muppets. Um, and in fact, um, Ryan Dillon, who is now doing Elmo, is one of our, uh, has come through the doors of the O'Neill with us. Um, Philip Huber, who works with us all the time, um, has done things like Team America and being John Malkovich. He's the manipulator who, and Marionettis, who did all the work in that. We've had a, a huge array of people all over the world doing puppets in every form and shape, in, in stage, um, in, in movies, in television. They're, we're all over the place. Do you take a moment to be proud of what you built there, you and others that, that have done this? This year we do. This year we're very proud. Mostly we're interested in the work. Mostly I'm delighted that people are paying attention to the art form and respecting it. And that's really what we're working for, to make sure the standard of puppetry is raised continually and that we're no longer a stepchild of theater, but actually a legitimate part of theater, which we have been forever, for centuries. Puppetry started, a theater started with puppetry, with a caveman making shadows and telling stories in the firelight. That's puppetry, shadow puppets. And that created the start of theater and entertaining each other with pictures and words. And that's what puppets do. Who, what makes a good puppeteer? What qualifications? Ah. Because you said 100 people you turned away. Yeah. What is it that you're looking for? Um, again, a commitment to the art taking it seriously as and generally we go with professionals this is not a hobbyist mm -hmm. convention mm -hmm. you know it's this is what all of us there do for a living this is our bread and butter so I'm looking for people who are very serious who have a certain artistic flair 
who have a commitment to the style of work they want to do because not everybody comes and does the exact same style. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come and only want to do marionettes or only want to do shadow puppets or only want to do tabletop which is a 3D puppet that walks that people takes three people to work. Those are the kinds of things I'm interested in and then people who have a love for the art. Who, I mean, I have them write me an essay about why they want to come. So they tell me, if they tell me how much they love this and they really want to do it, they're in. You're creating new works of art there right. for the stage. Tell me about some of that. Let's see. This year we have, um, well, we do a little mini conference before the main conference starts. And this, this boy, you're tough on people. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just show up here. No, you can't. You really can't. Um, and what we created in that week was um, we, we, people created a mechanisms, very specialized mechanical puppets, and we're doing a whole show this year with, um, uh, with Jim Krupa, who's one of our guest artists, one of the major mechanical builders in the world, and especially the world of television puppetry. But he's created a whole stage show with these, all these mechanics, these eyes that blink and little birds that fly. And um, it's a delightful show, Cowboy Western, with all these amazing characters in it. Um, Ronnie Burkett comes from Canada, and he is wonderful dramaturge and writer. So people will create little one-person um, monologues with a small puppet that they have to create in one in three hours or something. So they're making it. Oh yeah, right we're there. all making puppets Out as well. Out of whatever. whatever you have there. Or you bring materials or people have very specific ideas of what they want to build and that's what they do. The most amazing thing you've ever seen at this conference over the 25 years you've been doing it where you just went, oh my gosh, that's revolutionary. Um, some of what we have this year, we have Hugo and Inez from Peru, and they do body puppets. And what they are able to do with their body and a pair of eyes, or their body and a nose only, and you believe in the whole puppet, and you believe everything that you see. It's always the people who can get you out of saying, oh, look at that cute dolly, right? The people who make this puppet alive and breathe life into it, and then have a wonderful story to tell you. That's, that's the most amazing thing that I've seen there, the people who can do that. Let's see some of your work. Speaking okay. about breathing life into puppets, <laughs> okay. explain who this first well, guest is. Well, this first guest is called Polka Dots. I'm Polka Dots, Polka Dots, Polka Dots. And he was part of Blue's Clues, Blue's Room. We took Blue's Clues and made it a three-dimensional show. And I was Blue's best friend. That's why I'm Polka Dots, Polka Dots, Polka Dots. Blue's best friend. You might have seen me once or twice, maybe. When somebody says, you're gonna do this puppet, do you start getting ideas for this? It's all written for you? You can run off the script a little bit? It kinda is both. Um, they'll, they'll let you, it's hard for me to have a puppet on and not make it talk. It's just what I do. <laughs> um, it's a little bit of both, where people will give you an idea of what they want. And sometimes, very specific, that's not the voice we want. We want it lower. We want it higher. We want you to talk up here. Because you do a lot of voiceover yeah, work, that, so this is right up your alley, too. Right, and this is, I mean, voices are part of who the character is. It's not just the voice, it is the character, but you have to have vocal training in order to do puppets well, and particularly in the medium of television or film. And stage, too, because you have to project it. So um, you get the script, and the producers will have an idea of what they want, and then you get the puppet, and then they become who they are. Because a lot of times the puppet, you just channel wherever that personality is coming from, it's this combination and you that makes it what it is. And how do you think up, or it's, it's expertise, obviously, the nuances that this particular character The does. what? The new what? The nuances? <laughs> what is she talking about? Is that a chewing gum? <laughs> it could be. Come back. Yeah. So how do you, it's just working with the puppet and how it might react to right. something? Right. You, become, you go inside their head and, and explore how they see the world. You're seeing the world through their eyes, and their responses are from what you think they will be. And then you add the voice, and then you add the script, and you add the interaction with the other characters, which is also very important. And puppets react. That's why it's easier if you have someone talking to them and then them just doing a whole monologue. They're better at reacting to a situation, looking at it, analyzing. So there you are. Are you better, if I, if I talk to Polka Dots, as opposed to another puppet talking to it, him, her? I think I'm a him. Him? I don't, I don't <laughs> remember anymore, frankly. <laughs> I'm a him. What, what's harder? What's talking to, to a human or talking? I mean, obviously, it's different it's movements. It's about the same. If, if it was another puppet, you just treat him like a human, I think. 
<laughs> and I don't know which is smarter. I don't know either. Puppet. <laughs> what was fun about playing this role? Um, I just did this for a short time. There was a number of them, but being Blue's best friend was really fun because I just followed her around and I did what she said and I had a really, really good time. And when she was sad, I would sleep with her. Keep her warm, fuzzy, and happy. That's what I do. I can't imagine doing this. This is, this is really <laughs> amazing. You brought another friend with you. I brought another friend and this. Goodbye, polka dot. Bye! I'm getting on now. I don't want to go back in the box. <laughs> How heavy are some of these? This is a little more uh, grand. This, this would be... I'm Leona Lyon. I'm from Between the Lines, a TV show that taught reading. It was great fun. The eye... I'm on hiatus now. <laughs> you can get some rest. The, the eyes have expression. Right. You know when she was talking about the mechanic guy builder? He built my eyes. Let me see what you're, what you're using. This is a... Um... Uh, uh, the control is on the rod of her arm, and it's a lever that I pull back and forth, and it opens and closes her eyes. Puppets go up and down, sideways, lean, I, head. I, I, that is a coordination that you've had to develop, because all of these puppets are different. Everyone's different, absolutely. So when you first get a character, you really got to become one yeah, with them. Yeah, you play with it and figure it out. And of course, every year that you do them, it becomes a little more smoother and natural, and you know what's going to work for them the best. That's what you do, right? What did you enjoy about this character? Um, for me personally, she was just in love with reading and learning, and um, she had a very irritating brother that they had a great relationship with. Her older brother drove her crazy. So it was just absolute fun. It was just the most joyful show to work on. Um, we shot it both in New York and in Boston a little bit, and in Mississippi, because Mississippi Public Broadcasting picked it up and wanted us to do it there. So one of the wonderful things she did, we did is after Katrina, we were shooting during Katrina, right after Katrina we came in and shot, and I got to do tours of the South with her, visiting children who had lost everything, and we brought them books. And they were, so many kids were delighted to have a new book again because they literally had lost everything with Katrina. And we went to schools where they said, it's the first time they've smiled. This is six weeks. I went six weeks, 12 weeks, and 16 weeks after Katrina to visit all these kids. And it was just a joy to be able to do it. And my personality is so good at that. I'm so good at visiting with kids and telling them to read because it's so important. How did that experience playing this role in the South with kids who lost everything. How did that change you? I think it made me very, very grateful for the life that I've had and the life that we lived. And it changed me in that I've always worked for a humanitarian, I mean, who, I have a wonderful gift to be able to work for humanitarian causes that's fun and brings joy. And all it did was make me recommit to doing that always, that we move forward in humanitarian ways to, to help each other out and do it in a joyful, fun way with, with kids and adults. I mean, I can sell a lot of things to adults with a puppet that, you know, you can't get other people to listen to. Well, I just want to say that millions of kids have been so lucky to have you teach them <laughs> you. on Sesame Street and <laughs> continue you. to. And Pam or Cyril, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Anne. I love you, Anne. Same to you. <laughs>